Hello, and welcome to the Ask Historians Digital Conference session. I make the governor call me governor, rewriting the history of women's agency. My name is Jennifer Borgioli Binnis, and I'm Ed History 101 on Ask Historians. I'm a freelance editor and fact checker for academic and education authors, and I'm absolutely thrilled and delighted to chair this panel with these brilliant historians. Our panel explores women's agency by looking at three different groups of women. Our talk and the roundtable discussion will get into themes like motivation, the nature of power, who has it, who's denied it, and the historiography of women's history. Before we start the session, however, we'd like to acknowledge that the Ask Historians Digital Conference is taking place on the ancestral, unceded, and treaty territories of many Indigenous peoples who have stewarded this land since time immemorial. We offer our gratitude to these peoples and recognize the colonial nations continue to benefit from the brutality that enabled the original settler colonizers to seize these lands. The AHDC organizers acknowledge both the land upon which we are virtually hosting this conference and the deep rooted and long lasting harms caused by white imperialism and settler colonialism. We invite you to read our full land acknowledgement in our video description below. We'll be starting our panel with Chelsea Hartland, known as Morag Larson on Ask Historians. She will soon be defending her dissertation from the University of Guelph. Her research addresses Scotland's judiciary court as a social, legal, and bureaucratic institution during the first half of the 16th century and explores questions about violence versus violation, including how gender and status figure into the perpetration and prosecution of homicide and near lethal assaults. Her most recent publication is Catching Fire, Arson, Rough Justice, and Gender in Scotland, 1493 to 1542. And the book, Crossing Borders, Boundaries and Margins in Late Medieval and Early Modern Britain, published by Brill. Chelsea will be talking about her paper, Standing Their Ground, Women in Warfare in the Anglo-Scottish Borders. In both academic and popular representations, the Scottish border region of the late medieval and early modern periods has been cast as a violent, lawless, and masculine area. In recent decades, the culture of violence and conflict has become better understood, with historians like Jackson Armstrong advancing strong arguments about the positive organizational role that raiding and feuding played in regulating social, cultural, and economic relationships. The first of these, cattle raiding, formed an integral part of the border economy. Otherwise known as stealth reef, plundering, or heirship, this is not the most feminine sounding pastime, but my co-panelist Julia Stryker might have some thoughts about that where the high seas are concerned. Indeed, Scottish historians like Maureen Mickel and Jackson Armstrong have established that women raiders were not really a thing as well as unearthing evidence of tacit agreements between cross-border raiders to leave women and children alone. Although women certainly played a role in concealing and selling stolen goods, we have yet to find examples of women rounding up and stealing cattle themselves. In terms of feuding, in the borders and elsewhere in Scotland, this sort of conflict was typically instigated by members of the nobility and landed elite, hashing out their differences and seeking vengeance for past wrongs through mostly legitimate expressions of strength, honor, and authority. These conflicts drew in lots of untitled, unlanded tenants, but the one constant is that this dynamic is traditionally quite masculine. When historians go looking for women in this context, we typically find them showing up as mourners or brides in marriage settlements. However, if that was the extent of their involvement, I wouldn't be giving this talk today. The title of this paper is Standing Their Ground, Women in Warfare in the Anglo-Scottish Borders. In the 16th century records of Scotland's Justiciary Court, the highest criminal jurisdiction at this time, there are glimpses into the ways that some women engaged in forms of violence typically reserved for men. There are three things that all of these women have in common. First, they are almost always noble women. Second, they attack people of the same or similar status. Third, they overwhelmingly command violence rather than committing it. In terms of status, most of the women were invested with authority in their own right, while others obtained their status from their husbands or broader kin relations. Some women, like Margaret Hume, prioress of North Berwick, were responsible for maintaining and defending ecclesiastical lands. Her 1549 invasion and oppression of lands belonging to Alexander Oliphant of Kelly with the intent to kill him suggests territorial disputes. Others, like Barbara Hume, wife of Alexander Lauder, had strong ties to powerful kin through their natal and marital families. Barbara and the 21 other panels accused of the cruel slaughter of William Guthrie of Kingani appear to have been under the protection of the Semples, who were a rather powerful family, not so much in the border regions, but a little further north in Perth. 
The victims of these women were of similar status, but in cases where the victims were not noble or landed individuals, it was probably the case that the ambushes, assaults, and invasions were meant to send a message to someone higher up on the social ladder. In 1536, Elizabeth Martin, Lady Fastcastle, was accused of the housebreaking, slaughter, and arson committed against the ostensibly untitled and unlanded James, Peter, and William Bissett. In another case, Dame Mariota Montgomery, Lady Semple, was found guilty of sanctioning her servants to commit the slaughter, wounding, mutilation, and imprisoning of several men, none of whom appeared to have been titled or landed individuals. Without more information, it's not clear whether these attacks were related to noble conflicts, but it is a relatively safe guess that the victims were casualties of their kin or tenant affiliations with the targets of these women's violence. So given the extent of the damage, ambushes, invasions, slaughter, wounding, mutilation, and taking prisoners, we would expect these women to suffer some serious consequences, yes? We know from scholars like Garthine Walker and Alexandra Shepard that violence was coded into early modern masculinity in a way that it was not for women. Violence was one way of demonstrating manliness as embodied in physical strength and prowess. In Scotland, these imperatives contributed to a complex relationship between lethal violence, justice, and masculinity, wherein society expected that conflicts between men would eventually erupt into violence if left unchecked. Thus, when women did commit violent physical assaults or homicide, there were fewer interpretations available to those charged with punishing them, in part because it was just not as easy to justify or mitigate the violence of women who were cast as either unnatural abominations or the unfortunate pawns of manipulative men. Accordingly, several factors affected the likelihood that a man or woman would be convicted by the justiciary court. In the first place, women could not be convicted of crimes they did not commit. In Scotland, women were less likely to take part in the warlike scenarios that led to property offenses, which were more easily repaired by compensating the victims compared to making amends for loss of life. While men were often accused of homicide or grievous assaults in addition to arson, stealth, repair, ship theft, and other offenses, women were only rarely accused of more than a few offenses, slaughter, wounding, or forethought felony and oppression. In one or two rare circumstances, a noblewoman was held to account for instigating her vassals and tenants to commit warlike violence, but these are exceptional instances. Women rarely committed homicide or near lethal assaults in large groups. Furthermore, and this is perhaps the most important factor, they tended not to upset or undermine social hierarchies by assaulting or killing those above their own social rank. It seems that women of higher social standing received different sentences than those further down the social hierarchy, potentially due to their ability to pay their way out of trouble. But for those few titled women who instigated others to commit violence on their behalf, the court may also have interpreted their actions in the context of loyal servants or tenants obeying the orders of a noblewoman engaged in the legitimate expression of authority or violence. So back to Margaret, Barbara, Elizabeth, and Mariota. None of these women suffered capital punishment. Rather, all were fined, made to pay compensation, or pardoned for their roles in these altercations. But why? Because they weren't unnatural, nor were they submissive wives drawn into a life of crime but unsavory husbands. They were acting well within their social and political roles. In this period, homicide and near lethal assaults were acts of violence, but not always violations. That the boundary between violence and violation was so complex and tenuous is in part due to the ability of violent acts to both reinforce and undermine the patriarchal hierarchy that organized society in this period. Underlying these factors and further informing their relevance were the intersecting constructs of gender and status. From the initial experience of shame and insult to the perpetration of an attack all the way through to sentencing, identity and associated social norms informed when, why, and how men and women committed violence, whether communities perceived these actions as legitimate or illegitimate, and how, accordingly, the court handled a case. In the 16th century, the court was increasingly taking an interest in excessive and warlike violence. Identity played a key role in deciding what constituted violence and what constituted a violation. Ultimately, the line that divided violence from violation was different from men than it was for women, and women found themselves in situations requiring violent defense or retaliation far less often than did men. Although it has been widely acknowledged that violence played a key role in the maintenance of order and social hierarchy, men and women did not have equal access to the uses of violence in this period. 
While titled and landed men were often in a position to enforce boundaries with violence through judicial raids or by exercising curial rights afforded to them by the crown, women were far less often directly involved in violence as a form of social control. The men charged with keeping order in the localities were steeped in a culture of chivalric citizenship that had evolved from medieval notions of chivalric masculinity to blend with early modern concepts of citizenship and protection of the common weal. In this way, the connection between masculinity, honor, and righteous violence persisted and infused 16th century political and personal relationships between Scotland's greater and lesser magnates. This was a key factor in the survival and utility of the feud throughout this period. When the honor and authority of male landholders came under attack, it was expected that they would retaliate. But the overlapping concepts of honor, violence, and citizenship were pr not presumably enmeshed in the femininity or the responsibilities of women in the same way. Nevertheless, as we have seen, some landed women did indeed defend their lands competently in the absence of husbands or other male relatives who would otherwise handle that responsibility. When these women instigated violence in defense of the family name or properties, it was perhaps unusual, but well within the bounds of acceptable behavior for women of their station acting in a man's stead. Thank you so much, Chelsea. Our next panelist is Claire Burgess. She is a doctor of philosophy student in early modern history at the University of Oxford. An Oxford-inspired graduate scholar, her research focuses on the history of women in the 16th and early 17th centuries. In particular, she studies women in France, Spain, and Spanish colonial possessions. Claire is also the conference assistant for the online seminar series, Woman Blah. Feminism and Social Movements in the Global South, and is publishing an article this autumn in Women's History Today about Indigenous women's access to the colonial legal system. She will also feature in a guest episode of the French History Podcast, speaking about her research into the women of the Guise family and their actions during the French Wars of Religion and Beyond. The title of her talk for this panel is Weaponizing Grief, the Women of the Guise Family and the Catholic League during the French Wars of Religion. The Guise women were crucial in the sustained rebellion of the Catholic League against King Henry III in the 1580s, but have been excluded from most histories of the wars of religion. I want to examine how they manipulated the conventions of feminine behaviour to exert influence over a major political and religious movement and to preserve their family's place in French noble society. I'm going to discuss three women, the Duchess of Namur, Anne d'Est, the widow of the second Duke of Guise, who subsequently remarried to the Duke of Namur, only to be widowed a second time. Her daughter, Catherine Marie de Lorraine, the Duchess of Montpensier, a childless widow who devoted herself to her family's cause. And finally, the newly widowed Duchess of Guise, Catherine de Cleve, wife of the assassinated third Duke of Guise and mother of the new Duke, who was only a teenager. By demonstrating how the triumvirate of Guise women were able to manipulate the conventions of feminine behavior to play a role denied them by society, I intend to highlight that in the face of increasing restrictions on their actions, women's responses showed creativity, intelligence, and a refusal to abandon their positions of power, despite the enormous obstacles they had to face in order to exert that power. The early modern period saw increasing restrictions on women, and in particular, their roles outside the home. Scholars such as Sarah Hanley have persuasively demonstrated that in France, the later 16th century was marked by a concerted effort to bolster state and monarchical authority, and that this involved the reinforcing of the patriarchal family unit at women's expense. Women's legal freedoms were limited in the 16th and 17th centuries, and stricter controls were placed on marriage and reproduction. Widows were specifically targeted and were subject to new regulations during the 16th century that restricted their ability to remarry, to inherit, and to pass on property. But other women also experienced legal subjection to men, which aimed to guarantee obedience to the slowly centralizing state. During the French Wars of Religion, some women played significant public roles, and this resulted in a backlash aimed at excluding women from political life. De Vila characterizes this as the foundation of a new public order, in this context, women sought ways to exert influence and authority. For example, elite women were able to access power indirectly through patronage and unofficial influence as wives and mistresses. This has been amply demonstrated by Sharon Kettering, among others. This is not to suggest that women were unable to have political roles, simply to demonstrate that there were narrow avenues in which they could assert power, and that doing so meant staying within the boundaries of acceptable behavior. 
Grief was an acceptable and even necessary emotion in the early modern period. It was seen as proof of love for a deceased family member and was frequently used in propaganda such as pamphlets, which were short printed texts produced cheaply and intended for broad audiences. For women, expressing grief at the death of a husband, son, father or brother was not only legitimate, but expected. As such, there were expectations about how women should express that grief and boundaries between legitimate and unacceptable forms of expression. Women were expected to show their grief passively, as displayed in the trope of silent tears held up as an ideal form of expressing grief. The church envisaged roles for widows, which involved good works, religious devotion, or dedication to family. These are all passive pursuits, requiring widows to retire from public into family or pious life. Similarly, mourning women's voices were commonly adopted in laments or complaint, songs which often used the passive, inconsolable grief of a woman to make a political case. Women's grief was used politically, but not by the women themselves, who were idealized as passive, silent, and retiring. The women of the Guise family, however, were unwilling to remain passive. They conducted a sophisticated and effective propaganda campaign against the king in the wake of the assassinations of the Duke and Cardinal of Guise in 1588. They were able to do this by exploiting the acceptability of feminine grief. They used their grief as a resource with which to justify their involvement and win support for their cause. It was grief which underpinned their propaganda and the feminine nature of their campaign made it successful. One of the crucial aspects of their propaganda campaign was Anne Dest's desperate attempts to recover the bodies of her sons. One pamphlet described how she had thrown herself at the feet of the king and queen mother, begging in vain for the bodies of her sons. Those bodies had actually been decapitated, dismembered, burned and their ashes scattered on the king's orders in order to avoid their use as relics and the further transformation of the brothers into martyrs. This denied the women of the Guise family the opportunity to play the traditional role in the funerary commemorations and the construction of the memory of the dead. Thus, private grief became public outrage and the king lost the war of propaganda. Women played a vital role in perpetuating the memory of deceased family members, commemorating them at their death and ensuring that their legacy was secured by raising their children and continuing the dynasty. Catherine de Clev, the Duke's widow, quite literally assured the future of the Guise family after her husband's death by giving birth to his posthumous son. This allowed her to further use her grief to mourn the father her child would never know and made her a sympathetic figure to the masses as she was amply fulfilling the expectations of a noblewoman. 14 years before the assassination of the Duke and Cardinal of Guise, the previous Duke, the husband of Anne d'Est, was assassinated. After his death, his mother and widow staged a procession of the mourning women and children of the family across Paris to the church where the king was attending Vespers. They were followed by a contingent of armed soldiers, adding an air of menace to the tearful supplications of the women. They fell to their knees in front of the king, begging him to seek justice for the late duke. Moved to tears, he promised to do so. This procession was a perfect demonstration of the power of feminine mourning to force a political decision a lesson which the Guise family did not forget. Catherine Marie de Lorraine was one of the mourning children involved in the procession, and upon the death of her brothers, she attempted to recreate it. The crucial difference was in the tone. Rather than appealing dutifully to the king, who in this case was responsible for the assassinations, she appealed directly to the people, demanding they take vengeance against the tyrant. She dragged her brother's crying children into the street and made their plight clear but she set a tone of angry defiance, demanding vengeance instead of justice. All three of the prominent Guise women specified vengeance as the goal, not justice. Their calls for violence against the king were numerous and vehement, and they justified the proposed regicide by asserting that Henry III was in fact a tyrant and thus his assassination would be justified. Their grief allowed them to assert their case, suggesting that only a tyrant would leave a mother mourning the death of her sons especially when those sons had been the most stalwart defenders of Catholicism in the country. Anne Dest addressed Henry as an inhumane tyrant in a letter immediately after her son's murders. And a similar letter from Catherine de Clèves to the Pope expressed radical ideas about the sovereignty of the people and their right or even duty to punish an unjust and cruel king. Grief was the perfect veil with which to justify such statements. 
as it transformed them from disloyalty towards a rightful king to the desperate and understandable pleas of bereaved women and allowed the people of Paris to sympathize with an inconsolable mother, a heartbroken widow and a furious sister. The traditional roles of women in mourning and the preservation of memory allowed the Guise women to justify their power and to legitimize their calls for rebellion and regicide. Their grief was a powerful weapon which the League propaganda fully exploited. There's a lot more detail I haven't been able to include here. I would have loved to discuss how Catherine Marie de Lorraine breached the norms of femininity in ways that her mother and sister-in-law did not and how this led to her vilification. I also suggest that her disability, as she walked with a limp, and her childlessness were also taken as evidence of her inability as a woman. However, what I have demonstrated is the ways in which the women of the Guise family were able to use their own grief as a weapon against the king in order to perpetuate public support for the Catholic League. In doing so, they manipulated and subverted the norms of femininity, which prescribed ideal ways of grieving, and took a central role in the organization and propaganda of a major religious and political cause. They were far from the only women to use the expectations of femininity to exert power, but, and there are similar examples across history. What makes the Guise women exceptional, I would argue, is their bellicose and vengeful rhetoric and the way in which they so effectively reintegrated their family into court society after the wars of religion were over. Our last panelist is Julia Stryker. who will be talking about her paper, Masculinity, Mythmaking and Women's Place at Sea in Maritime Life. Julia received her MA at Memorial University of Newfoundland and is currently a PhD candidate in history at the University of Texas at Austin. Her current research uses shipping contracts, law, and literature to investigate women's work at sea in the British Empire, particularly in the 19th century. She also pursues digital humanities methods, including using Python to map the voyages of women working at sea, and is a member of the Cost Action Women on the Move, a transdisciplinary network of researchers working on women's labor mobility. Welcome, Julia. Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl, starts with Mr. Gibbs repeating one of the better known and more often repeated maritime superstitions. Bad luck to have a woman on board too, even a miniature one. This is the second superstition he offers, but the first, that singing about pirates will call pirates, is plot-based, not historical. So repeating the women are bad luck on ship superstition is, let's say, historical flavoring, an optional coding of historical realism. But why say it? What kind of flavoring does it add? How actually historical is it? Were women considered bad luck at sea and what did it mean if they were? The answer is yes, and in practical terms, nothing. Women went to sea anyway, and if they were bad luck, then mariners were spectacularly bad at avoiding bad luck. We can talk about the origins of the bad luck belief, but what really interests me is why it's so popular. How does this, out of all the superstitions, have 700 year staying power? I study women working at sea in the 19th century British merchant marine. And my work sits at the intersection of social and labor history, legal history, and cultural history. I know women went to sea because we see women going to sea in the records. We didn't used to, but we do now. And we can also talk about why historiographically that is since I study that too. But what's probably more interesting is the question which drives the historical part of my research. Why such a disconnect between the fact that women went to sea and had been going to sea and in the 19th century, we're going to see a lot more and stories of life at sea, which are full of the idea that women didn't go or didn't belong at sea when they did go. Why are the stories we tell different from the records? Why do we come back so often to the idea that women were bad luck? Though there's a few, one of the big issues in studying women at sea is separating absence of evidence from evidence of absence. And one of the more potent examples of this is not my work, but the 18th century British Navy. The Admiralty banned women from ships in 1731, but as N.A.M. Roger argues, women were to some degree regular inhabitants of ships, particularly below decks, though their presence was entirely unofficial. The common sense assumption usually goes that if women had been aboard, either they eventually would appear in official records or somebody would have said something. First, it's important to note that admitting in the official records that women were aboard would have gotten the officers in trouble. And second, they did say something about the women aboard. Suzanne Stark notes that Admiral Jervis was obsessed with the women of the fleet wasting water and waged a long but futile campaign against them. She cites an exchange in Jervis's memoirs from 1797. Admiral Nelson responded to Jervis with, I know not if your ship was an exception, but I will venture to say that not an honorable, that is captain, but had plenty of them. 
them being women, and they always will do as they please. Orders are not for them. At least I never yet knew one who obeyed. But then it's often said that these women were put ashore before sailing, and this is where official records do come through. In 1847, Queen Victoria announced the Naval General Service Medal, a campaign medal for various wars between 1793 and 1840. The medal roll lists two women who applied based on service on the Goliath at the Battle of the Nile in 1797, Anne Hopping and Mary Ann Riley. Interestingly, these women don't appear in the muster book of the Goliath, but according to David Cordingly, four others do, Sarah Bates, Ann Taylor, Elizabeth Moore, and Mary French on the strength of their being awarded a two thirds allowance for service as nurses and as widows of men slain during the battle. Jane Townshend also appears on the roll for her service aboard the Defiance at Trafalgar in 1805. There are two notes by her name written by Admiral Sir Thomas Byam Martin, one in favor of awarding the medal based on the strong proofs for her claim and another right by the first denying her claim on the basis that she was only one of many women equally useful to the fleet and that giving her the medal would leave the army exposed to innumerable applications of the same nature. Now, the argument usually is that these must be unique outliers, but they're not unique outliers because women were unique, unless you think Jervis was going on about nothing, but because they appear in the official records. It's worth noting what it took for these women to make it into the historical record, and it's worth noting when, and it's worth noting why they were ultimately discarded. It took battles on the scale of Trafalgar and the Nile. It took a market hungry for Napoleonic memoir, and it took the first real British campaign medal. And ultimately they were excluded from commemoration both because they were too many and because no matter their actions, they were not the ones meant to be there. This continues in the 19th century. What happens is not that women start showing up though their numbers do increase and their positions aboard do professionalize, but that women become recorded. They become recorded both by accident and because what gets recorded expands generally. But the problem lingers of discovering what exactly these women are doing aboard and figuring out why there's little historical memory of them. Naval records start earlier and generally cover more, but records on the merchant marine pick up in the 19th century, where, due to a number of factors, bureaucracy really takes off. My research uses crew agreements, which have a long history but get really refined in the 19th century. Previously unacknowledged women show up on these agreements. But this is not a simple reaccounting of who is aboard. This bureaucracy takes a long time to develop. And for much of the century, recording women remains optional. In the 1873 preliminary report of the Commission on Unseaworthy Ships, ships are still sinking with women working aboard, but unrecorded on the agreement. So what do we know about women's lives at sea in the 19th century? Well, there aren't many firsthand sources, but one is the account of Anne Saunders, who went to sea in 1826 as a servant for the master's wife with her fiance working as cook in exchange for passage. A wave stove in the stern of the ship and the remaining crew spent 22 days trapped on a partially submerged wreck. They resorted to cannibalism. While she did write her own account, the newspaper, The Caledonian Mercury offers a dramatic telling where Saunders on her fiance's death, shrieked a loud yell, cut her fiance's throat and drank his blood, insisting that she had the greatest right to it. She won the ensuing scuffle, but magnanimously allowed her adversary to drink one cup of blood to her too. They say that Saunders had more strength in her calamity than most of the men. When the breath was announced to have flown, she would sharpen her knives, bleed the deceased in the neck, drink his blood, and cut him up as usual. Like the battles, this represents exceptional circumstances preserving a woman's experience. The crew agreements reflect regular women in average circumstances. But as Eric Sager describes them, these accounts are fragmentary and part of a long conversation between seafarers, officers, and the state. Sometimes evidence that a woman is aboard awaits birth, sickness, or death. Sometimes it's the only thing recorded about her. But sometimes there's more, like the account of Sophie Hall in the official log of the Lottie Warren from 1864. This wasn't the first altercation between Sophie and the master, but unlike birth, it highlights a woman's participation in pretty typical seafarer agitation, complaining about food. In the log, Sophie, at the breakfast table, without any provocation at all, a favorite phrase of log writers, commenced to be nasty and abusive. She accused the master of taking aboard bad provisions. This wouldn't be worthy of recording, but then she commanded the third mate to muster the crew to bring their complaint before the captain in direct disobedience to the captain's order that he did not want to see anyone while getting his breakfast. Sophie's situation is unusual, which might suggest why she felt emboldened to make this complaint. She was aboard not only with her husband, the cook, but also her brother. However, we only know about her brother because he died in May of that year and his belongings, instead of being auctioned, are left in her care as his sister. This altercation happens in August. No way to know, but certainly grief and bad breakfast don't mix. 
So picture the 19th century. The French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars go from 1792 to 1815 and are a pretty huge deal navally. Steamships start up in 1812 in the UK and fun fact, the last naval battle fought entirely with sailing ships is the Battle of Navarino in 1827. The first British nautical novel is Marriott's Frank Mildmay published in 1829. The Naval General Service Medal, remember, comes in 1847. With more time, we could delve into the connections here, but for now I have to appeal somewhat to experience. As people living in interesting times with an underlying theme of rapid technological change, perhaps we can appreciate this heady mix of war-driven nationalism, technological development, and nostalgic pop cultural commemoration. While it seems like what changed is that women became present aboard, looking back, what changed is that women gained an acknowledged place aboard. That place came in the midst of a massive reordering of maritime life down to the very facts of how it was lived what work looked like aboard, and yes, who participated in shipboard work, but not necessarily in terms of gender as much as, na as nationality and race. And as the age of sail slipped away, culture clung tighter to it, replacing memory with mythology. This mythology, like a lot of classical mythology, contrasted a lost golden age with modern reality. Violet Jessup, who should be famous for her fantastic memoir, but is mostly famous for surviving the Titanic, reflects that while a woman was a rarity in a shipping office when she first signed on in 1908, by the 1930s, a woman could enter that same office and not even be noticed. That there were women now meant that there weren't women then, because in a golden age, things are better, and men are better, so more men is more better. That is, through myth-making, through commemoration, what had been a predominantly masculine environment became idealized as an exclusively masculine environment. Now, we know that the exclusivity has been greatly exaggerated, but we still cling to it. We still tell the story that puts a woman there just to tell her that she doesn't belong. And partially, this is just repeating what people said at the time. But it is also a refusal to reconsider the narratives that we hold dear and to wonder why we tell ourselves the stories that we do. Thank you so much, Julia. I could listen to the three of you talk at length about your topics. And what I'd like to do to start off our roundtable conversation is to pull back a little bit. The three of you are women historians studying women history. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on the larger topic of women's history and historiography and how you've seen it change over time. So for example, are you the first person to look at your particular topic? Are you, many of you mentioned other historians, but I'd be curious about your thoughts on women's history and and the historiography of women's history? Um, so I think for me, it's really interesting because for a lot of my women, they haven't been studied. So out of the three of them, um, there's no biography of Catherine de Clerve, there's no biography of Catherine, de, Catherine Marie de la Reine. Um, and the biography of Anne Dest is only available in German at the moment and is a very recent thing. So it's not that they haven't been studied, but I don't think they've been given enough individual study. And I think that's largely a part Ooh of what had happened in the intervening years. So after the wars of religion were over in the 17th and then 18th century, French historians really wanted to sort of masculinize the monarchy and, and really throw away the women who had been heavily involved. So Catherine de Medici, who is the queen mother at this point and is really important, um, but also women like the Guise. So I think they were kind of cut out and a lot of people don't know who they were because of that, but they're finally getting a look in again. We have a similar thing. Well, it's different in in Scottish history. Uh, it's sort of a well-known, I don't know if it's a joke, a lamentation, if it's like a, fa a facepalm moment, but we're, we've been about a decade or two behind all of the other European historiographies when it comes to women. And a part of that is, I think, because um, Scottish history has for so long been treated as like a piece of English history. Uh, that there were a couple of decades of catch up with people, you know, we did, we did political and constitutional history a little longer than England. We did, then we did economic and social history a little later. And then we did, you know, the cultural turn happened, but it wasn't like fully embraced as fast as it was in other places. And then feminism naturally, you know, it just like, it, it was really slow. Um, so in 1999, my advisor, Elizabeth Ewan, had said, you know, we're still in the excavation phase. Like in 1999, we're still finding women. Um, thankfully, we're way far past that now. There was a really good article recently on the state of, of gender history in Scotland um, by Katie Barclay and some others. And 
we're doing well now. We're actually starting to get into sort of like what is what is feminine, what is masculine, what about gender history, what about this? So what's interesting in my work is that um, it's partly the records that I look at. Uh, if you want to go looking for women and deviants in Scottish history, you're going to find borough court records, you're going to find church court records, you're going to find studies about petty crime, about economic stuff like forestalling and brewing licenses uh, and then like prostitution and adultery you'll find all that fun stuff but we don't have a ton of research on violent women or or homicide in women um, until you get to say like the the enlightenment really with Anne Marie Kilday and someone else who's new I've forgotten now oh god the book's called weep not for me it's vote infanticide can I remember who wrote it no um but that's it. So mine's a very tiny piece. My entire thesis is actually not about gender, uh, really. It's about social control and, and state formation and, and this criminal court. But that one chapter I insisted on is kind of where this, this paper comes from. And it's um, it's following in Garthine Walker's footsteps, saying that, you know, it's not enough to go looking for women. It's not enough to go study women on their own. Uh, women are 50% of society. Women were in these courts, maybe not in the same amounts and not for the same reasons, but I, I, I don't like the idea of taking women out of their context and looking at only female criminals. Uh, so I like to sort of compare and do more relational work to, to really figure out what's the role of gender overall and how this stuff is being understood. And I think that's something that comes through in that when you look at the records, the women are there. You mm -hmm. know, when you look at the primary source and the, and the archival material, they're there and it's been <laughs> obvious. And yet, somehow for some reason historians have just kind of gone no we, we won't talk about that 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 doesn't count um and I think that's what it is it's putting the women back in it's it's not sort of yeah. creating it it's not sort of myth making um they were always there they've just been ignored well I just I, I feel like I can I can yeah the commemoration issue that Claire brought up is a big deal right like it's how they want the how they want things presented and you have to sort of fight about it from the time the historical event passes into the past to the present, like that's just a constant thing. But then um, also what you say about separating Chelsea, they uh, separating women out and talking about them as if they're not part of the continuous society uh, also doesn't work very well. Um, and this is one place where I can say that hooray, maritime history niche as we may be accused of being has actually been on this for a long time. Um, so good on them. That's why I really wanted to bring in NAM Roger because he's been such a, he's a stalwart He's a he's a eminent eminent historian, and you know, in his surveys, he's like, "Well, women were there." I don't know what you want me to say. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you want me? He's not gonna lie, so I don't know. Um, but uh, oh my god, I was gonna say something else and I forgot. Oh no, I have a great historiographic story about this because right, the the metal thing I talked about, the metal role. So um, the, one of the main articles for that is from the 1930s. The maritime history is also a very aged focus. <laughs> um, so, but it, the, the guy who wrote it was a naval officer named Robotham and he found Jane Townshend and he was just like, hmm, isn't that weird? And left it, that was it. He was like, this is just a weird thing. And I, he talked about it. It's not like he pretended it wasn't there, but the idea that this, was at all relevant to the greater historical story was just not gonna happen, so. I think that's why it's important for people to go back to records that have already been looked at because one thing that you'll find in, with my justiciary court records, they're awful, they are like degraded. The secretary hand is just like, there are still some days where I have to screenshot things and put them on Twitter and say, ah, uh, friends, like, what is this word? I can't, I cannot for the life of me figure it out. But we've been relying on these print editions and the justiciary court records that we have in print are from 1833. Um, and a guy called Robert Pitcairn put them together and he just like, it's a selection, let's say. It's abridged, not everything is in there. I can't, if you looked at the printed editions, you would say, oh, women just never committed crimes. And he has this very flowery description of there is this woman who was burnt at the stake um, for treason in the 1530s, Janet Douglas. She's like pretty famous Lady Gloms in our, like our, our, our history. And he has this like half of the information about her is, oh, and this delicate, fair <laughs> Scottish flower was much maligned. And I'm like, okay, so you're not biased. 
Like there was this whole idea of representation and like, well, we can't be seen to have unruly, violent women in our history because what would that say about us as a society? So let's just not put them in the print edition of these records. They don't exist. So if you actually go back to the manuscripts, which are a pain to use, but they're so valuable because can I say there's an abundance of women? No. But are they there? Yeah. And they're doing really messed up things. And it's really fascinating. Yeah. I mean, for me, there's something similar in terms of what you're saying about like the, the compilations of sources, because a lot of the ways in which women had influence, they that doesn't come across in the laws or, you know, the, the official histories. Um, so there was one woman early on when I was doing my thesis and I wanted to talk about her because she was a widow. She was um, and sort of um, damned on her, like a, a lady in waiting, that's the word, um, to Catherine de Medici and then to the Queen of France. So she was really, really involved. And her husband died quite early on in their marriage. And she was responsible for arranging her son's marriages, for running all of their properties and actually advancing them. So she managed to get them a dukedom, a huge amount of land, all this kind of thing. But when you look at the official records, you never see her. She, she doesn't show up. You know, there's her wedding certificate and that's about it. But then when you go to their private letters, she's everywhere. And even when it's not a letter directed to her, it'll be, for example, a letter from her brother-in-law to her son that says, well, ask your mother because we all know she knows what she's doing kind of thing. And it's so nice because at the time, clearly her family and people outside the family are recognizing that this woman is powerful and clever and good at what she's doing. But in the history, she kind of slips away, um, which I think is, again, it's, it's a product of what gets memorialized, what gets turned into print and into um, official sources. Um, yeah, it, it's not great. And, and on the other thing, when you're saying about um, all the, the horrible things these women did, Chelsea, I mean, I, I have to agree there because at the moment, it probably sounds like I love the Guise women and I do, they're interesting, but they're also awful. Like really awful in a lot of ways. I mean, these are devout Catholics who genuinely think that the existence of Protestantism is a threat to their lives, to their social society. So, you know, for example, on the East family estate, um, the women of the previous generation burn a couple of people at the stake and this kind of thing. They're not nice. They very likely arranged the assassination of the king um, and of several other people. Um, when he died, they went around sort of chanting and cheering and giving out green scarves, which was the color of their house. So, you know, they're, they're not necessarily lovely, but as you say, they're fascinating. Um, and I think it's really important that we do that for women because there are plenty of men who are really awful, but they're still seen as viable historical subjects. Whereas for a lot of women, it's, well, you have to be pretty and you have to be sort of good and virtuous. And it, even in the sources, um, Anne Dest is most like most often known as just this beautiful woman who, you know, there's a quote about her where it says something about like she had gotten two good husbands and even in her 40s, she could have gotten a third. And I think okay, but she wasn't <laughs> trying. She was busy running the Catholic League nearly. It drives me crazy. <laughs> I'm wondering if I could piggyback on what you're saying about those nice women and, and how Chelsea talked about, uh, you know, how the women that one woman was written about. And I wonder, Julia, about the woman who chose to step onto a, sh onto a boat and or a ship. And I'm wondering about motivation. So, and I'm wondering, how do you as women, histor as historians who study women's history, these particular women, how do you reconcile the the nature of motivation, like what compelled these women to do the things that they do? How can lay people better understand the role of motivation for your women, the women that you study? I can, I can jump in on that one. Cause actually it's a big argument. I want to start with my field. Hooray. Um, so when you have this question, right. And this actually, it came up in what Chelsea was saying too. Cause right. One of the things you said was that, um, a lot of the women that have, you know, have been found, have been found because you're sort of looking for them in places where women are found, right? Like, and I mean, this is true of all of us to a certain degree, but um, when you do that for women at sea, right, you get one story. Uh, and it's a very good story. It's a very accurate story about how steamships enabled women to get jobs and they became professionals and it's cool. 
but then you get this alternate sort of story that goes with it. So since like the 1960s or so, since like labor history became a thing, they've been trying to get into like, why did men go to sea? Like, was it really adventure? Did they really just want to like taste the salt air, sea in your blood, yar har har, like whatever. Um, and that's great. It's a good question. And they get to the inevitable answer, which is that people went to sea for a lot of reasons. And it wasn't necessarily this romantic lifetime appointment that you went into because you loved. Um, but then when you get to women, right, you start looking for women, you find them where you expect to find them. And then you say the thing you're expected to say, which is that, well, they just didn't have as many choices. And they only went aboard if their husbands went aboard. And it was only in the case that they had nothing else that they could do, right? It's a very, it's a story that's framed by the question of oppression, uh, which is uh, what Gil the Learner, I think, brought up. Um, and I don't like that question. I don't think it tells us anything important. Um, well, it does tell us important things about oppression, but it doesn't tell us anything about the women, right? So what I found just by trying to look at things generally, just by trying to look at things in place, is that uh, they went to sea for the same reason that everybody else went to sea. It was a job. It was a job. It was a job that you could get. Maybe your husband was in it. Maybe your family was in it. But that's how everybody got their jobs. That's, it's not different. You know, if you frame it as this thing about how uh, women's opportunities are limited and, you know, they weren't necessarily, you look for the feminist motivation of like, they went to sea just to stick it to the man. You know, they went to sea because they could. And some of them did and some of them didn't. And some of them had no choice and some of them did. Um, so I guess I don't, uh, we're never going to be able to get at their actual motivation because none of them wrote it down for the <laughs> most part. You know, wouldn't that have been nice, guys? Thank you. <laughs> it, even Ann Saunders, right? She's writing her story. And it's really about like, I was saved because I found Jesus. And you're like, well, you were saved because you ate your fiance. Like, let's be honest here. <laughs> it's you were, yeah, let's. Yeah, interesting. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, barring it, finding anybody that writes down that they went to sea because they wanted to eat their fiance, they went to sea because they had no, you know, just because that's what. It was something they could do. They could get paid. They could get a job. I think that that's so similar for my women too. It's like, I'm never going to go back and find a letter or an entry that says, oh, I tried to kill this guy because X. Um, although I did find a really good one where um, sometimes you can kind of infer things when you have details. So for me, I, I just ask the same questions about my women that I do about my men. Like, we have all this research that suggests that it's about, you know, violence is linked to honor. And if your honor is injured, then you become sort of shamed. And then shame turns to anger and anger turns to hate in the whole like dark side of the force situation. And then you, then you get all your buddies together and you're like, all right, we're going to show them what's what, because I cannot allow this insult to stand. Why would women feel any differently? I mean, we don't have evidence, but it seems silly knowing what we know about psychology and sociology and anthropology and and social relationships that women would kill for sort of the specific reason might be very different but the underlying reason is ultimately someone made you mad <laughs> like um and i think that sometimes i mean women are just as likely to engage in this these these vengeful relationships as well uh this one isn't a homicide, but I have an example from, I think it's 1510s, but anyway, it's in there. It's in the early uh, 16th century. The entry that I have in the court record says that a woman and another man were pardoned for mutilating a guy, but it doesn't say what. So I went and looked at the register of the Privy Seal, and that told me that the two of these people mutilated the man in a very sensitive area. And in fact, it wasn't mutilation, it was demembration, which means taking the piece of the body off. Mutilation is just damaging it so it doesn't work anymore. Demembration is removal. And uh, it was a part that meant that this man would not be able to have any sort of progeny after this particular event. And so, I mean, we can't know for sure, but I'm feeling like there was a bit of maybe sexual assault or something that happened. And uh, this feels like a pretty reasonable response. So yeah, sometimes if you get those details, you can kind of infer like, hmm, I think I know what may or may not have happened here. 
Uh, but of course, we'll never know. And my records are really awful for just saying so and so has been told to come to court on this day for the slaughter of this person. Mm. That's it. I, I don't know what happened. I don't know why. We don't have depositions. Sometimes there are process notes and other documents that may or may not exist or you may or may not have access to. But yeah, it's a lot of guesswork and a lot of estimating. But that's like what we do as historians. We make a lot of educated guesses. <laughs> Yeah, I think I'm kind of the lucky exception in this case, um, which is definitely a product of studying noble women and very, very senior noble women. Um, so like the Guise are without doubt the most powerful noble family um, in France at this time, obviously accepting the royals. Um, so they really, I know why they did what they did. Um, they make it very obvious. There's a lot of correspondence. There's a lot of outright pamphlets um, where these women sort of say, you know, the, the tyrant, King Henry III has murdered my children and therefore, and I'm thinking, okay, I mean, that's a good reason, good. Um, but they also do it so that there's that personal motivation. Um, and as you're saying, it's kind of honor, you know, they, the, the family has been disrespected. They want to get revenge and they want to sort of redeem the family's honor. There's a fascinating case in that, in which um, I mentioned in my paper, Catherine de Cleve gives birth to a, a son um, after her husband dies. That son, um, early in the 17th century, goes on to have a duel at the court of um, Louis XIII, in which he kills another man. And when you look at the details, what actually happens is he killed this man because the man was involved in the assassination of his father. So sort of 20 something years earlier. Um, and his mother, Catherine de Clèves, sort of um, prays for mercy because the punishment for that is death. Um, but she prays for mercy and she says, well, look, he's only doing what I would do if I weren't a woman. You know, you can understand why he's trying to take revenge. It's his honor. Um, it's the family honor. And it's exactly what I would do, but I can't. So th there's a lot of really clear motivations that, that they are very explicit about. And that's so helpful. Um, it's also a complete exception, I think, you know, to studying very, very senior figures within a society. Um, but I think there's also for a long time in the, the wars of religion in the, in the historiography people discounted the importance of religion they looked at it as oh well they're doing this for political gain um and i just don't think you can do that and now there's been a movement to kind of reinstate the religion there's a brilliant article and i cannot remember who wrote it about putting the religion back in the wars of religion because people genuinely believe as catholics that allowing protestants to live will cause the end of the world quite literally there's a lot of um really apocalyptic thought going on um and i don't think you can discount those religious motivations so so for these women they think that having i mean the king isn't protestant but they think he's not a proper catholic so having him on the throne they think is sort of going to cause the ruin of the country and the end of the world so you have to i think accept the religious motivations as well you can't discount them um and, and even when people sort of pay lip service to God, they actually mean it. They're not saying, you know, just to fit in. They, they I really do believe, especially with women as devout as these, um, the Guise family was notoriously Catholic, sort of infamously Catholic. It's so interesting because what I hear all three of you talking about is how, you know, the women aren't a different species. They are human beings who have the similar motivations and they're motivated by the same thing, you know, that men are motivated by the same thing women are and vice versa. And, and it's, I think it's really fascinating to think about um, the overlap, even though you're looking at three very different things, how there are a lot of commonalities. And one of the other things I was kind of struck by is going back to the nature of agency. And, you know, when you talked about how um, she didn't, that one woman didn't, didn't do a duel because she couldn't because she was a woman but there were some things she did that women quote unquote weren't supposed to do so i'm wondering if you could speak to i guess the ceiling or the limits of their agency like how did how did they decide how far to push it like julia did you come across any women who are like okay that's it i'm gonna be the captain now like they decided they were gonna be the captain or like how did I, I, yeah, so I'm wondering if you talk about the limits of agency and how the women you study decided to stop pushing or did they push as hard as they could and got as far as they could, if that makes sense. So for me, I think with the three women, there's a difference. So um, Anne Dest and her daughter-in-law, Catherine de Clèves, they use femininity. They manipulate it, they subvert it, but they stay within the boundaries. So they use it for their own ends and that's what makes them different from other women, but they're still 
within what's acceptable. So what I was saying about grief, that's a very normal and sort of wholesome role for women to play. Um, and then the other part of my thesis, which I didn't talk about today, is about how they sort of reintegrated the family and how they won their place back under the king. And again, that's part of this conception of women as peacemakers, as sort of um, reconcilers. And, and that fits again. The difference is Catherine Marie de Lorraine, who is so much more violent, so much more masculine, um, she carries a pair of scissors around in her belt at all times as a, and, and she threatens that if she ever sees um, King Henry III, if he's ever captured, she will tonsure him herself, you know, give him the monk haircut and this kind of thing. So she really, she's violent with it. She actively pursues his assassination. And there's a lot of sort of circumstantial evidence that she is behind it. And a lot of people think she was. Um, she really, she sort of says, at one point he um, threatens her and he says, if you don't stop what you're doing, um, I, you know, I will capture you, you will be burned to the stake. And she actively says, well, fire isn't for pious people like me, it's for sodomites like you. So she's very, I, I know, right? She, she goes for it, she doesn't hold back. But because of this, because of the fact that she doesn't have children, she doesn't try to remarry, um, she, she walks with a limp, which for a lot of people is seen as unfeminine and she should be hiding herself away, but instead she's out on the street sort of stirring up the people. That's not feminine. And, and that wins her a whole lot of um, disapproval. So there's, there's pamphlets, um, one in particular, which claims to be a list of all the books in her library. Now it's very obviously not, but a lot of what the books are listed in there is like um, things about her sexuality, which they suggest that she's sort of this licentious um, sort of whore almost. Um, and, and they really go for it. So they say that she slept with the assassin of the king and that was the only way she could persuade him, things like this. So they really villainize her, whereas they don't do that to her mother and her sister-in-law because they stay within what's acceptable. Yeah, that's, I mean, to, to me, what I find in my records is there's a lot that status and influence and money will get you out of. I mean, the entire, that's part of my dissertation, right? The gender is a, a, a part of it, but through the whole dissertation, what I'm trying to argue is that Basically, if you're if you have enough money and you have enough status and you have enough influence, you can do whatever you want. Um, there are certain, also in Scotland anyway, there are certain social dynamics where, because I mean, in the 16th century, Scotland is not like I'm so sorry, Julian Goodair. It's not like a an absolute state. Like it's it's trying. The the Stuarts are trying and they're trying to sort of centralize things, not just geographically in Edinburgh, but like to sort of have this this network of of interconnected agencies where the power kind of flows from the king out through it's, it's, it's their agents. But um, the, the thing is though, that the regional magnates are still extremely powerful and these families can command large standing armies. And the king in Scotland or the monarch or the region is just sort of like the top noble. They're not this, despite all the, the rhetoric around like, oh, I'm God's chosen and I'm more special than you are. Like the nobles are not afraid to sort of say like, we don't really like what you're doing. And remember that we can get the entire border region to just stop listening to you if we want. Or, I mean, James V was, his whole minority, he was being shipped around the country by different people and different factions, um, sort of taking control of the personhood of the king. And it's it was just, it was a volatile situation in a lot of cases. And so these women, have associations with very powerful families and an attack on the woman is an attack on the family and women didn't give up their family associations or their their birth names when they married they just sort of created a link between two kin groups so it's not like oh well i'm not a douglas anymore i'm a semple or or what have you it's i'm both and if you mess with this one person, there's a very good chance that these two families will find common cause to go after whoever has harmed them in some way. And so the king and other nobles have to be really careful about how they respond to women who maybe are getting a little uppity um, because trying to smack them down could have severe consequences for the political and social stability of the realm. Claire's right when she says that there's this sort of separation when you have a when you have a, a high status person who's able, you know, one, their records get preserved, their thoughts get preserved at a much greater rate. 
uh, but two, they're much more likely to write them down in the first place. Um, but uh, with respect to the differences, like the class differences are very, very real. So I don't want to you know, get rid of those, but I do want to say that it's partially from the uh, historical sort of interiority of these women of higher status that we can understand that these people are still thinking people, right? Otherwise, a lot of what I have is just numbers, numbers about people. Like I could tell you everyone's ages, actually they lied about their ages, but it's hard to tell. Um, you know, I could tell you what they said about how old they were. Um, but so when it's a question of sort of, did women, how far were they pushing back for the, for the working class women on ships? There's a lot of times when you could say them doing what they're doing is pushing back, right? Like they're, they're hitting that ceiling pretty hard just because I am a single woman on a ship and I want to go to Hawaii. So I'm gonna, right? Um, the married women are also sort of, a lot of them are getting paid at a rate that is usually better than the able seamen, although it's worse than the other officers. So it's not exactly like they're just appendages, right? Not always, sometimes, but not always. Uh, and then you do get the cases where we have, you know, especially captain's wives, especially um, women passengers, women who tended to write accounts and keep journals and that sort of thing. Um, it's a sort of cottage industry to have the woman come forward and take over the ship when there's a disaster, like you write a story about that, um, and not just stories, but people's experiences, a couple of them got really famous. Um, but it's kind of like, and this is Julia C. Bonham wrote a really good article about this in the 1970s, which I still find a very useful article. Um, although many, many women have worked on sort of whaling wives since then, like Lisa Norling and all these others. Um, but one of the things that she notes is the way in which kind of like what Claire was saying, these women are, are leveraging the limits put on them in order to get things done that they couldn't get done. So uh, what Julia C. Bonham says is that the women that are going with their husbands on whaling ships, you know, frequently they're like, oh, you better teach me navigation because if you die, I'm running the ship back, right? Oh, you need to teach me this. Oh, I need to go with you because I'm supposed to be your helpmate. So I want to go with you because that's what I'm supposed to do, right? It's still like, I don't know. It's such a, it's such a hard thing to prize apart what is limiting them versus what they are using in order to get more out of their situation. I, I think one of the themes that I'm taking away after listening to you share is the importance of recognizing both the individuality of the women and the systems within the op within that they operated within and that each one of them made different decisions for different reasons and agency is both a function of what the woman chooses to set and what society sets around her which is just so it's so so fascinating and thank you so so much uh, i think we're going to start wrapping up so if there was anything else that you wanted to share related to women's agency related to uh, public history please yeah, in terms of closing remarks, I just want to say thank you for a really stimulating discussion. I, I think that if anything, any one singular thing has come out of this discussion that I want to leave everyone with, it's that I think what we might have shown today is that women are people too. Thanks very much. Chelsea's just beaten me to it. I was going to use the women are people line. Um, I think that's absolutely what we've shown. Um, my only other sort of desperate request is that if there are any sort of TV writers or producers out there, please come on. These are great stories, make them. Um, because I think there's so much power in that. There's so much that is so interesting. Um, you know, give the geese woman a story maybe. Yeah, I totally agree. W women are people and um, sign me up. I'm gonna watch the show about the geese woman, please. I would love to see that. I absolutely will drive the viewer ratings there. Um, and thank you to the fellow panel. This was wonderful. Um, I love these conversations. I always learn so much. And then uh, I just want to say, enjoy that pirate movie, man. Like, I, I know that I say a lot of stuff about people getting ignored and how it shouldn't happen, but uh, love it. Love that media. They're so fun. They're so fun. Just because I said there should be more women in it, then they should stop being such jerks about it. Doesn't mean you can't enjoy that. Watch all the pirate movies. Many thanks to all three of you. We look forward to seeing viewers in the Q&A that we posted later this week.